Spanish translation. Um, and it's hosted by the Maritime Spore Support Unit or the MSSU. For those of you that aren't familiar with the MSSU, we are an organization that supports patient-oriented research across the Maritimes, including Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI. Uh, we're one of 11 units across the country that engages in patient-oriented research. And my name is Scott Anderson, and I'm the Knowledge Translation Coordinator at the MSSU. So I'd like to start by giving a land acknowledgement, and I'm currently located in Nova Scotia, so that's going to be the basis of my land acknowledgement. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wolastoiec people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolastoiec title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people. We are committed to developing authentic and meaningful relationships with Indigenous communities and supporting the inclusion of diverse perspectives in healthcare research across the Maritimes. As part of this commitment, we also recognize the histories, contributions, and legacies of the African Nova Scotian people who have been here for the last 400 years. So today's session of Keeping Up with KT will be focused on the science and practice of patient engagement and setting research priorities. I'm gonna start by introducing all of our speakers and then um, our speakers will give their presentations and then we'll have a question and answer period. So our first speaker today is Dr. Anthony Otley, who will speak to the science of patient engagement and setting research priorities. Dr. Otley is the head of the Division of Gastroenterology and Nutrition at the IWK Health Center and, the professor, and a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Medicine at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. His research interests include the development and evaluation of outcome measures used in pediatric clinical trials. Two examples of this include IMPACT, a disease-specific health-related quality of life questionnaire for children with inflammatory bowel disease, and the Pediatric Liver Transplant Quality of Life Questionnaire for post-liver transplant. Other research interests include the use of enteral nutrition, which is delivering food to the stomach or intestines through a tube, as a primary therapy in the management of Crohn's disease. And he has a special interest in under understanding the role the gut flora may have to play. He's the Maritime Principal Investigator of the Child CAHR Canadian Pediatric Inflammatory Bowel Disease Network and the SPORE Imagine Network, which studies the interactions between inflammation, microbiome, diet, and mental health in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. Our second set of speakers is Laura Lee Dalrymple and Robin Sully, and they will speak to the practice of patient engagement and setting research priorities from the patient partner perspective. Laura Lee Dalrymple is a patient partner of the Myeloma Priority Setting Partnership. Laura Lee works as a team lead for Alberta's largest credit union. Since her 2009 diagnosis, she has been extremely active in the Canadian myeloma community, holding roles on the Myeloma Alberta Support Society Board, currently in the role of president, and served on the Myeloma Canada Patient Advisory Council, where she was the chair from 2016 to 2020. Laura Lee has been instrumental in Myeloma Canada's support group leader and advocacy summits, the Myeloma Awareness Day at the Alberta Legislature, and the Myeloma Canada Early Diagnosis Program. She is a board member of the Canadian Myeloma Research Group and was a steering committee member of the Myeloma Canada's Myeloma Priority Setting Partnership for Research in Canada. Laura Lee was thrilled to join the Myeloma Canada Board and ensure the voices of myeloma patients are represented. Robin Sully is also a patient partner in the Myeloma Priority Setting Partnership Project. She is a retired international lawyer with 20 years of experience supporting the rule of law and human rights programs in Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and Eastern Europe. In 2012, she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma and is currently co-chair of the Ottawa Gatineau Myeloma Community Support Network, a member of the Ottawa Gatineau Myeloma Walk Committee, chair of the myeloma, Multiple Myeloma Ontario Advocacy, Advocacy, Advocacy Committee, and a board member of the Arn Prior Regional Health. So, um, I'll turn it over to Tony now, who will speak for 20 minutes, and then after that, Robin and Laura Lee will speak, and then we'll have a question and answer period. So is everybody seeing a full uh, slide presentation? If it, one slide, I mean. Yeah, we can see that, Anthony. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Scott, and thanks everybody for joining us uh, for today's session. Um, what I'm going to speak about, uh, if, uh, 
from a sort of a researcher clinician perspective is a priority setting partnership we did a few years ago uh, across Canada for pediatric patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, inflammatory bowel disease for those who aren't uh, familiar in just a few slides. These are my disclosures. So to start is what, what is patient engagement? And certainly if you uh, talk to in the, in, the, in the clinical setting, in the hospitals uh, and among researchers, um, this can mean different things to different people. I think many people will be familiar with uh, Dilbert, uh, and this would not be uh, what we would expect from true patient engagement, uh, and that it's just superficial, and that you're, you know, we 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 talk about it, but we don't actually follow through. That's not what we would want with patient engagement uh, in research. If you consider research and the sort of the process of what happens in research. Um, so to begin with uh, developing the research question, uh, so the circle on the upper left, and then once you've identified that question, identifying and prioritizing your objectives and outcomes from that research, designing the research, managing the research, conducting the research, and then finally analyzing and disseminating the, result, disseminating the results. And at all those steps, uh, patient and family engagement can be critical uh, to, uh, improve the outcomes to optimize uh, the success uh, of research. And uh, I think there's been uh, through work uh, done initially at the UK, uh, but now spread to other countries, a, a great understanding of the impact of truly involving patients in the research process. And you know, this hit home to me um, early on in my career where I was working with uh, children and parents to develop, to develop a health-related quality of life questionnaire for children with inflammatory bowel disease, where we're, we were speaking, interviewing with, with children. Um, but it's this um, finding, this research, and I'm gonna pick on my rheumatology colleagues for a bit with this, that really exemplified why it's so important to engage with patients and parents. Um, so this was, uh, uh, an international group of rheumatologists, so studying arthritis, uh, and they formed this group, uh, OMERACT, which was to look at outcome measures. How do they decide with new interventions, uh, whether a treatment, a new drug, or some other intervention is successful or not? So what are the outcome measures that you should use in arthritis clinical trials? And so they met and they uh, arrived at this decision and they actually kept updating this but it was um, about the sixth iteration. So they'd been meeting for a number of years already and um, they decided, why don't we get patients to participate? And up to this point, the main outcome measure was pain. Makes sense, arthritis, pain, that's the main outcome measure we're gonna choose. But as part of that process, uh, they surveyed patients and lo and behold, pain was not the most dominant feature that concerned patients. And maybe in the chat room, uh, people can, we'll just take a few seconds, uh, people can maybe put what do they think was the number one uh, symptom that uh, patients uh, felt was the most concerning to them? Any thoughts as to what that might be? Oh, you guys are all too smart. So that's, it. that's exactly right. So fatigue was the symptom that topped the patient list and not and not um, pain. I'm you know pain was there, but it wasn't the number one concern. And they wouldn't have determined that uh, if they hadn't involved patients in that in this process. So again, for me, that really highlights why it's so important uh, to include patients uh, in the process. But I don't study arthritis. One of the areas, and, and I don't care, um, I don't care. I don't look after. I'm not a, a physician for uh, arthritis. Uh, but for children and teens, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, for children and teens uh, with inflammatory bowel disease, and that's probably the most significant uh, disease with burden uh, that I, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, follow. Uh, and for those who are not familiar, there's two main types of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And uh, it, with Crohn's disease, it's inflammation anywhere from the, the mouth to the bottom end of the bowel. 
And for ulcerative colitis, it's just inflammation in the, in the large intestine. And on the left here is a picture from a normal appearing large intestine, and on the right, what it can look like inflamed. And when it's inflamed, there can be pain, diarrhea, blood, decreased energy. It has, there's many different symptoms. And in children, it also can impact growth. I think this um, picture, this uh, is pretty powerful and highlights to me again, the impact that this disease can have on our patients. Um, and Messerschmitt was a, a German Austrian sculptor and it's felt that he likely had Crohn's disease. At that point, it was not named such, but uh, was this digestive complaint and he lived with pain all his life. And one way to help him sort of uh, focus through and to get things done was he developed this pinch where he would pinch the lower right, like, lower right rib and with this have these different grimaces and as a sculptor, what he did is he um, made these life-size uh, sculptures of these different grimaces and ended up with 64 different unique uh, grimaces that sort of represented it, represented the different pain uh, that he experienced. I think, again, a pretty tangible, powerful example of the impact of this condition. Uh, through research that we've done with colleagues across Canada, we've shown that IBD is on the rise and particularly in children uh, and especially children under five years uh, of age. And this is work that's being done over the last uh, 20 years showing increased uh, rates. And we have the uh, dubious honor in the maritime provinces of having the highest rates of IBD in the world. So uh, certainly as a clinician uh, taking care of patients uh, with pediatric IBD, but also as a researcher trying to find out uh, answers to uh, how we can better manage, how we can better treat IBD. Uh, I'm fortunate to be part of this Canadian IBD research network involving the children's hospitals from across Canada. Uh, and as part of that, we took an opportunity through a grant competition from CIHR and the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research or SPORE and Patient en Engagement to look into this uh, uh, establishing a patient uh, priority partnership uh, to identify the top 10 research questions in pediatric IBD in Canada. And, and that's what I'm going to elaborate on now. So we, through some research that we did, uh, found out about the James Lind Alliance. Uh, and James Lind, for the people that aren't familiar, was a Scottish physician. And he was really one of the, conducted one of the first ever clinical trials when he developed the theory that citrus fruits might cure scurvy. He was a, a physician with the Royal Navy uh, in the 1700s uh, in, in Britain. Um, and uh, this group, the James Lind Alliance, uh, has been very active in the UK and uh, they are now part of their National Institute of Health Research and really have standardized this patient engagement process that I'm going to elaborate on now and that Laura Lee and Robin will talk about from a patient perspective. So this priority setting partnership really guides the, the different steps. Uh, we did what's called a modified uh, uh, James Lind priority setting partnership in that we didn't actually have James Lind Alliance um, members on the, the involved in the process, um, but one of our steering committee members, um, Dr. Lopakis, uh, had done a number of these already. So he had the experience and we sort of availed ourselves of that experience. So one of the first steps uh, in the process is to form a steering group. And you want to make sure that you um, have a broad membership. So clinicians, uh, patients, uh, and in our case, particularly where our patients are pediatric patients, also caregivers. And, and so uh, the makeup of our steering group uh, we wanted to have, we wanted this to be a Canadian uh, endeavor. So uh, representation, representation from different provinces ac um, across Canada. Um, we wanted pediatric patients, patients who were diagnosed uh, in the pediatric age range, but have now transitioned to adult care, uh, caregivers, as well as clinicians and not just physicians, but uh, we had a dietitian. Uh, and an IBD a nurse who dealt with children with IBD 
uh, in part of their clinical practice. So this was an example of our uh, steering group. Uh, and then the next stage uh, in the process is that initial stakeholder meeting where we're being, bringing people together to uh, make sure they're on the same page. We, we're clear about what our question is and uh, the sort of the principles of this partnership. Uh, and there's a sort of pro a process for getting everybody to literally sign on to that and that we're all in agreement uh, going forward. And then the next step is to solicit questions and un or uncertainties, and they're variably phrased as questions or uncertainties uh, around pediatric uh, IBD. And we wanted to make sure that we uh, surveyed and we, we reached uh, patients, parents, as well as clinicians as part of this process. Uh, and from this solicitation, uh, we receive a lot of uh, questions and what we need to figure out are all those questions are truly unanswered because that's what we're interested in. Uh, and certainly some of the questions we received, there are answers. So you need to sift through and determine which of the questions that have been uh, put forward have an answer and don't. Uh, and then there's this process of bringing together because you can have literally thousands of questions, uh, bringing together into summary questions to retain some unique questions. You need to do, there's a, a searching the existing literature to determine whether there are que answered or unanswered questions. And, um, and then there's uh, reducing. You need to bring it down to a, uh, a workable number to do that final priority step. Uh, and so, and, uh, and I'll sort of give an example for ours exactly how we, how we did that. So we did a, a national survey and the other part of that steering group was to identify partner organizations. So for us, it was Crohn's and Colitis Canada, the Child Foundation, which was the funder for our pediatric IBD research network, uh, the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology, Canadian Digestive Health Foundation. So again, depending on uh, the research topic, the, the problem that you're uh, looking to uh, do the priority setting partnership with, um, different partners will, will come up. So we wanted their social uh, media networks to help advertise and make people aware of this uh, through our clinics uh, across Canada, we did this. Uh, and so we had over 366 participants, patients, parents, and clinicians. And from that, that process, we derived uh, over 1200 raw questions. Uh, again, when we sifted through those, there were about 626 unique questions, of which, after that review of the literature, uh, 388 were unanswered and in scope. In scope meaning that we're really around pediatric IBD um, and, and that we're a, a research question or could be made into a research question. Uh, and, and then there's this further uh, process of um, sort of whittling down, uh, joining questions if they're really uh, sort of covering the same topic to uh, determine these uh, what are called indicative questions. There's also a process where we're reviewing the literature. So the, there was another 32 questions from clinical practice guidelines uh, until we had these 105 unanswered questions. And then we did a second national survey to do a priority setting to get what were the sort of top uh, questions of interest uh, to that national uh, survey. And from that, we had 27 questions. And then the final step of the process was an in-person priority setting uh, meeting where we identified the top 10 questions. So uh, just to give an example of what were the sort of areas uh, that those questions covered of, of that 388 questions, you can see that there's really a broad range, diet, the cause of IBD, treatments for, emotions, what's the future hold, diagnosis or different ways of diagnosing this condition, what are the symptoms? So all sorts of different areas. And in that top 27 that went to that final meeting, uh, this was the, the breakdown. So for that uh, taught to determine the top 10, uh, we had an in-person uh, priority setting workshop. And up here in the left, it's just the makeup of who, who were participants in that. 
so clinicians who work with pediatric IBD patients, so physicians, nurses, social worker, uh, dietitian, uh, were involved with that. 14% were actual current pediatric patients, uh, former pediatric patients in, in red, a sibling of a, of a pediatric patient, and parents. And so those were the participants. And it was about, I think, 25 uh, uh, participants who uh, were involved in that one-day meeting uh, that we held in Toronto uh, from across the country. Uh, and as part of that uh, workshop, uh, we break into small groups uh, where each uh, member has an opportunity to offer their perspectives and to work to rank the items. And there's different iterations of that process. I think if we had to do it again, I would have involved more pediatric patients. Uh, the input, and again, that sounds, um, it sounds crazy when we're talking about patient engagement, but of course I, we would involve patients, but we, I, I think we involve more parents, um, but in the future I would have weighted it more heavily with the actual uh, teenage uh, patients uh, as part of the process. And they were very active vocal uh, participants. Uh, and this, this process, this um, listening that we do as part of it, and you can just see the different uh, table where we had these different questions and there was a lot of back and forth of, as to what placement you would, what ranking they would uh, have. Um, and you need to be flexible and listen. And, and I think transition, so transition from pediatric to adult care is an example. In, it was in my top 10, um, but it ended up around 17 out of those 27 uh, items. And so you have to be willing to give and to take. And um, I think the other is it really is important who you involve in the workshop. Uh, we had some very well-adjusted teams who participated. And um, maybe if that wasn't the case, maybe transition would have placed a little bit higher, right? But for them, that wasn't a big concern, um, specifically the, 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 the teens that we involved in the process. So that's just one example where who is involved in that priority setting really can influence uh, the process. So it's, it's a great day, long day, uh, but sometimes there's a little bit of silliness that happens uh, but uh, it, it really is that there's a great community that, 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 that comes from this. So this was uh, the top 10 and we then did sort of the next step or the next stage was really communicating this to the community, to, to researchers. Uh, and we did that through creating infographics in French and English, tweeting those out, uh, making those available to uh, within the clinics. Uh, and so that's a process that's ongoing. Um, and this is sort of my, my final slide, just to say that there is um, uh, a cultural aspect to this. And this is a separate study looking at uh, when we were working to develop a health-related quality of life questionnaire for children who've had a liver transplant. Uh, and there were uh, sites in Canada, the US, Australia, and the UK. And just highlighting, this was sort of ranking of priorities. Again, this is not priority setting partnership, something different. This was for quality of life items that would be included in a, in a tool to assess health related quality of life. But I highlight it because there are cultural differences in what those priorities are. And in this case, uh, their family having money problems really did was not that highly ranked except in the US group and you can surmise because of the different structure of the healthcare system in the US that that would be uh, that would be accounting for the difference. But I just put it there that uh, if we look at this priority setting partnership exercises, where is this being done? Is it at a provincial level, national level? Is it international? And that certainly I think can, can have a role to play. Um, and this is my last slide just to say thank you to a large group, the, the people that completed the surveys, the steering committee members, the additional members who attended the workshop, but it really, it's, uh, it takes a, a large effort, uh, but it is so uh, important. And, and we've gone on with subsequent grant submissions to really pull from those top 10 lists uh, to justify, to argue why it's so important to do that particular uh, research. Thanks so much for that presentation, Tony. I think you really 
uh, clearly set out how that process works and how um, really showed a great example of that in practice. Um, and before I turn it over to Robin and Laura Lee, I just wanted to say that if you are thinking of a question um, during these presentations, it's okay to write it in the chat, or if you do have a question and you'd like to say it out loud, just put your name in the chat and I'll be able to call your name at the end. Um, so with that, I'll just pass it over to Laura Lee and Robin for their presentation. Thanks so much um, and very um, excited and, and thrilled to be here. Um, I think, oh, there we go. Um, so I'm just, if you can go back one slide, please. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just gonna very quickly uh, tell you just uh, myeloma is, uh, incurable cancer of the plasma cells in the bone marrow. So while it is in, uh, not curable, it is very treatable. And it, it's thanks to the wonderful research that has been done over the years. As an example, at my, my diagnosis, the average life expectancy was three to five years. And that was just in two, 2009. And now it's 10 years plus. Um, and what I like to tell people is that's average and I'm not average. So I'm going to go way beyond that. But um, you know, some of the complications are chronic infections, anemia, uh, bone uh, involvement, and, and kidney involvement. So it can be um, very, very challenging uh, disease and very, very individual. So um, it is, it is a, a really tricky thing to, to navigate because this wonderful thing creates new clones. And so you're faced with multiple relapses typically throughout your 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 journey so um part of where are we here i guess the reason why robin and i were so excited about um being involved as the patient partners in this and i'm not going to go through what the process was in in the same level that that tony did because he did a great job of explaining it but from our perspective, really, it was an opportunity to have, to be engaged, to be involved and, and not have the doctors doing it to us or for us, but with us. And I think that was really an important part is, is, is truly creating that partnership. And, and coming to a shared understanding, because I know when we were involved in the process, you know, we would get so many different perspectives and it was it was important to hear them all. And, and we had an actual voice. We were at the table. It wasn't tokenistic. It, it was truly um, a partnership. And it was also a, a, an amazing venue to have engagement from a very diverse population cohort demographic. Like we had um, uh, similar to, to Tony, we had uh, patients and caregivers from across Canada, plus uh, clinicians and nurses and researchers. So it truly was a, a very diverse group. Um, next slide. So, so getting into the patient engagement method, um, you know, uh, again, it was it was getting that clear framework and the steps and understanding everybody's role in, in the process. And, and it ensured that everybody was, it was genuinely collaborative and we were involved right from the beginning, right from the steering committee, we defined the project parameters. We were, um, you know, in, involved in the monitoring program in, in monitoring progress throughout the whole process. Um, you know, define, uh, creating those questions or, or you know, uh, surveys, not questions, but the surveys and, and having the workshops where we're able to um, be at the table together. And I think what it does too is it, it provides scientific legitimacy to the initiative because you're ensuring that the patient voice was not only listened to, but it was heard and it carried weight. And I think moving forward, it's going to provide a very strong platform for further research and funding because there are some, some you know, people out there that they want to see their questions answered and, and they'll support that financially to, to get the, the researchers. 
Um, and, and one of the key things I found, uh, because we also went through the James Lind Alliance and we actually had James Lind um, facilitators involved. They were neutral, they were experienced and they ensured that the integrity of the process was maintained throughout the whole, um, the whole process. Uh, they ensured that we all understood the process and what the outputs would be and, and that all stakeholders, including those of us living with myeloma were heard. Um, I think the only thing that we thought could have been better, and, and this is sort of counterintuitive to what Tony just said, we think there could have been a little bit more engagement from the clinicians and healthcare providers um, in the initial stages. In, in, in the uh, workshop at the end, they were very, very engaged, but I think initially they were a little bit tentative um, and maybe that's because we had such strong voices as patients, but I think they were, I think they were actually curious to hear what we had to say. And so they maybe didn't, um, uh, they didn't engage as much initially because they wanted to hear, they really truly wanted to hear what we had to say. So it could have been a little bit uh, one-sided initially, but, but we got over that quite quickly. Overall, in, uh, being a, a participant in a, a, a priority setting partnership steering group was a very positive experience. It helped us build capacity in ourselves. Um, and we definitely learned more about myeloma. We think we're experts, but we're not because um, it is such a, a uh, an individual disease. So it was really a, a wonderful experience in that regard. But most importantly, I think it, it helped us to realize that we weren't alone in our experiences. There were a lot of shared experiences and it was um, a form of support as well. Um, next slide. So I think this is where Robin, I think you take over from here, don't you? I do. Thank you very much, Laura Lee. And thanks for this uh, getting us here. And Tony, thank you very much too for your outline of the process, because I think that our, we haven't gone into the details of what our process was, but it very much followed the steps that you set out. The only uh, difference was that we did, as Laura Lee say, engage directly uh, with, with the Alliance. So that was very positive for us in many respects, because we were very concerned about making sure that our data had had a scientific or a, um, a kind of a respected um, uh, framework was done in a respected framework because we felt that often patient voices are not heard because feeling that perhaps um, they're not coming from as much of a scientific base as perhaps other research and clinicians voices are so and that leads into what was um, I think critical to the implementation and success of the project were the resources that we had to pull on and the maritime spore support unit uh, coordinating unit was really instrumental. I don't think we could have done it, done this process without them. They brought commitment to the patient engagement, first of all, and they worked very closely with uh, the James Lynn Alliance uh, to communicate with us. So they provided detailed minutes, uh, meeting planning, etc. So this was really important to kind of support and, and drive the process. We had debriefings, we were, where things were understood, we were educated. Um, we, uh, they also provided investigation into the questions and they became a repository really of information and all the questions. So they really provided that instrument, that administrative support that was really important to sustain and, and dry and facilitate the process. They also, really importantly, provided skilled and experienced technical support. This was critical. So in terms of uh, formulating the surveys that, that as members of the steering group, we could, we could look at, but they really brought the expertise in that regard, uh, the research expertise, synthesizing all the data. So uh, Tony referred to the uncertainties and coming up with indicative questions. So they really brought we had 
over 600 participants. We had over 300, 3,000, I believe, um, sort of uncertainties that came forward. And so this was an amazing amount of data to have to synthesize and pull together into uh, these indicative questions. And they were absolutely um, incredible in, in doing that and pulling everything together. Um, and we also had, interestingly, um, you know, there was, to, to give sort of credence to, I guess, patient uh, input, there was a, uh, patients, um, they were, they were also allowed kind of, um, uh, they were provided with a, uh, some compensation for their participation. So to really make sure that, you know, it was very minor, but it would cover any transport that was needed or things to facilitate their engagement. And, and that was, I think, really important um, just to recognize the value of the patient as a team member. So we had, in addition to the resources, we had um, Milo McCanada uh, supported communication. So their outreach is incredible into the community. Um, they also have, uh, in moving forward, they provided funding for the process and they are gonna provide uh, the follow-up. They're going to uh, help with facilitating the follow-up, um, which is gonna be really important. So uh, the GLA or the James Lind Alliance, they were, uh, as, as Laura C Lee said, um, in terms of process, their facilitation, they provided a neutral corner and uh, which was really important, a neutral facilitator to bring all this together and also their experience in working with the process, again, further to give it legitimacy. And in addition, and importantly, we had the patients, caregivers, clinicians, and healthcare providers, researchers from across Canada. And they participated in the steering committee and the surveys and the workshop. So it really brought a broad engagement representing voices from diverse backgrounds, uh, treatment experiences, and accessibility. So we really did have uh, important resources that, that drove the port that, that drove the process and really we couldn't have done it without them. In terms of outcomes, this is really important. We had, as I mentioned, uh, over 600 participants from across Canada participated through the surveys uh, and in the workshops. Sorry, Robin, we need to advance the slide. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. you. I advanced mine. <laughs> Thanks very much, Shelley. So we had um, over 600 participants from across Canada participated uh, through the surveys and the workshops. Uh, the richness of data we obtained in those uncertainties, as I mentioned, I believe they were close to 3,000, will really help inform future research and educational opportunities. And what we did, and I think it was mentioned, this give and take um, and some questions, some people might feel their question was lost. And we said, really, no question is lost. We've set 10 research priorities were identified and it's, and it's quite a give and take process. Um, but really we're looking to those, the other questions that are back there because they are so rich in terms of education. I mean, some things are known. We didn't have to do additional research, but obviously there needs to be increased awareness about what the results are and where those education opportunities may be. So we really will look back at those questions as we move forward, but of course the 12 priority questions will identify our immediate research. I think the process too is an opportunity to inform and educate the community, our supporters and funded funders. So myeloma is not a huge number of patients. We're considered a rare disease. So it really gave us an opportunity for outreach into the larger community. And importantly, it established a benchmark uh, to monitor um, uh, future, uh, future research. I think um, in terms of follow-up, um, we are continuing to monitor. We're, we're going to, uh, Myeloma Canada has set up a fund to do some immediate research to provide um, funding for research in the particular priority areas. Uh, we've set up, we're looking at a monitoring tool so we can see how the results of this 
feed into in, in various ways, both in terms of research and creating more awareness. And again, we, uh, we are really stressing this, no question is lost because people put a lot of effort into this. They have serious concerns. And if theirs didn't reach the priority, it doesn't mean that at some point it won't be dealt with. So I think that pretty much covers, I think I've covered everything, Lee. Is there anything I've forgotten here? No, nope, you did great. I think we got okay, it all. I think we've covered it all that we wanted to cover. So we will just leave it to others to post questions or any comments that they might have. Thank you. Thank you, Robin and Laura Lee. Um, it was really, really interesting to hear about how the process supported you and um, how you felt you benefited from being a part of that process and sharing that with us. Um, so now's the time for the question and answer period. Um, so I just ask you if you do have a question to write it in the chat and I'll go through them in order or if you would prefer to say your question out loud, please put your name in the chat and I will call your name and then you can unmute yourself and say your question. Um, and just as we're waiting for the questions, um, I had a question for Tony. I was just curious, your project has um, was, was a few years ago. And I'm just wondering if from the um, top 10 that you've seen, have you seen that, are there ways that you have seen that spread out in terms of seeing people taking up those research questions or funders taking up that question that you could share with us? Uh, absolutely. So I, I think um, our, we're, our priority setting that final workshop was in 2017. So it has been a few years now. Uh, and through various CIHR, so like funding grant competitions, that Canadian Pediatric IVD Network just got funded again for another five years. And core in that was uh, arguing to the, or not, I'm not arguing now, uh, to put the case to the, the funder, the Child Foundation in, in BC, that you know, we were tackling the important questions uh, and you know, highlighting the, the top 10 uh, unanswered questions that we were going to work on as part of this next phase of the funding. So those kind of opportunities, um, uh, it's really certainly been important. And then we've also really trying to get the message out there to the patients um, uh, and potential funders uh, about this. Uh, and, and just what Robin was saying, also now, all those answered questions, uh, we're working on developing educational materials, videos, and I've just put that in the chat room, a, a link to those um, to, uh, to, to help people understand that we do have answers to some of those questions through research. So it's really sort of spun off all kinds of different, um, different work, different uh, endeavors. Thanks, Tony. Um, so I've just noticed Jim Jenkins has a question. If, Jim, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. Can I ask two? Anyway, Anthony, um, very, I'm very impressed with the patients you're getting involved with and the, and the parents, which of course in our case are part of the uh, patient partners as well as caregivers. So <clears throat> the numbers are very good. I, I guess there's one thing that I have to bring up because I know it's going to come up in our council and all that is that uh, do, we, do you consider the EDI part of your research? In other words, are you, do you feel that you're getting any representation from outside the communities and the Indigenous and the Blacks, and so on. So, it, Jim, that's a great question. I think, um, and if if you look at our, all, it wasn't all white, but it was a very Caucasian uh, makeup of our, our participants. So we could not say that we, um, uh, we had that EDI focus. Um, and, and I think, it, you know, over the last number of years, there's an increasing attention and importance of, of recognizing that. Um, there are certain cultural groups, ethnic groups, where IBD is more common and less common, uh, and so that may have played a role. Uh, certainly in the Indigenous population, um, that's, it's less common that, that inflammatory bowel disease or certainly in pediatric patients, but it's not that it doesn't occur at all. So I think going forward, it's those kind of considerations that you know, we would need to be pay more attention to because that, uh, that wasn't the case, certainly in the steering committee, um, uh, and Jim, I'd have to go back because it's been a few years. Uh, I can't remember if we solicited that. So from the or, or almost you know three or just over 350 participants in that first survey, um, whether we asked them their 
uh, their ethnicity, I can't remember. Thanks for that question, Jim. Um, so um, what, just one more to, to uh, Robin, actually, or to that group anyway, and that is, uh, so I haven't heard anybody talk about the CIHR now. Are they, uh, Robin, are you guys at all involved with CIHR in their, in their funding or, or, because the big thing that I, as a, I'm on their one of their committees, is the big thing with, the, they, they have really pushed patient partners. Of course, all the spore is from them, but they're also even pushing it even beyond that now. And I, I say it's going to be a really important part of anybody who takes on research, health research specifically. So anyway, Robin, did, have you had any dealings with the CIH? Well, I, I know that uh, Milo McCanada, Jim, thank you for the question, actually. I know one of the things we looked at in our, our, our follow up meeting was organizations that we should pursue in particular um, to make them aware of the priorities that came out of that. And that was one of the organizations because of the work they're doing and their focus on, uh, their continually increasing focus on patient engagement. But I have to say that, and this is an aside, I can say in, the, in Ontario anyway, uh, through the Ontario government, or the, across the whole spectrum of healthcare, they're talking about patient engagement. So it's so important uh, to access these resources for more research, because quite frankly, in many cases, it, it, it still remains tokenism. Thanks, Robin. Um, Tony, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I would just echo Robin. I, I think that's across uh, different health conditions. You know, Crohn's and Colitis Canada. There are patient partners on the grant review panels. Uh, you need to, uh, as part of your grant submission, indicate you know what is the patient engagement uh, component of your research. I and and I think that now is the it's just that's a a given uh, and an expectation, um, and it's shown and because. If we look at, um, I'm, I, I don't know the structure of Myeloma Canada, but uh, Canadian Celiac Association, is, its members are patients living with IBD. The fundraisers are patients living with IBD. And so uh, it's uh, critical um, if for, for the researchers to, to show that. And, and, and CIHR, other funding organizations, getting that patient uh, participation in the evaluation and assessment uh, is critical. Thanks, Tony. Um, so Trudy Flynn, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. Hi, <clears throat> I was part of a James Lind Alliance project that started back in 2014. Our workshop was held in 2015 and it was the top 10 priority questions for fibromyalgia. And uh, it was sponsored by um, CIHR IMHA Institute, which is the Institute of Muscular Skeletal Health and Arthritis. And um, I think maybe it was early days for the James Lind in Canada. I think they had only done one, on, one other project on kidney disease, I think. And so the one fault that I had with the process wasn't the process at all, uh, was after there was, we really didn't set it up so that we had funding available for any of the questions. And so the questions kind of languished on the CIHR, CIHR website for years. And only now um, do we look at those questions and we look back and I, I don't know if um, patients were steered in a certain direction because um, whereas, uh, some of you talked about how, oh, um, Robin, I think it might've been you, been you or, or Lorelei, that the patients were heavily involved in the steering committee. It was the opposite for us. The uh, physicians and researchers were actually more engaged. And uh, so they did most of the talking on the steering committee calls that we had, but our questions did not come like I'm really impressed with both of these projects, the top 10 questions, because there are things like cures and, and, and medications and things like that. Whereas ours were more um, 
things like how do you set up your workspace so you can work while you have fibromyalgia. So, you know, they, they weren't really heavily scientific questions. And as a result, we didn't have a lot of researchers pick up those questions. So I think it's important when you set up these kind of projects that you, you look beyond the actual uh, James Lynn part of it or the actual uh, workshops that you look beyond like, like the myeloma study did because having the uh, Myeloma Society involved ensures that you have the funding to get some of those questions answered. And I know that James Lind is a very expensive project to undertake. So, you know, it, it, it's important that you look beyond the project, that you look into the research following. So anyway, I, this is a really interesting, um, this has been really interesting. I, I appreciated both of your uh, projects and I learned a lot actually. And I think maybe if we ever set up another one for fibromyalgia, uh, it would be done differently. So thank Thanks. you. Thanks for your comments, Trudy. I think you like, it's great to hear you share about your experiences with the, the process as well. And just like highlighting um, the importance of setting things up so that the research questions are carried forward. It's a really important point. Um, well, could I just I'd you want to respond to that, Robin? Yeah. yeah, just a second. I thanks so much for that input. That's that's really helpful. I I think we had, had agreed and that the follow up is absolutely critical, um, and that was something that came out of our discussion too, because there had been so much energy put into getting this far, and we didn't want to just leave this hanging. So. I think it was really important that Myeloma Canada came forward with some funding. This is terrific. But in addition to that, um, they're going to follow up with a lot of organizations that provide research and create more awareness. And hopefully we can move forward with this. So I, I think that the work can't stop at the end of the, at, at, at the, um, at the James Lind, at the end of the James Lind process. The James Lind process really gives legitimacy I think, to the weight of those questions to allow us to move forward to press those organizations that may be funding research. And I just wanted to add to that too, that the myeloma spore support unit was absolutely amazing. And, and to, to go to your, your, your comment about the questions, Trudy, we were very, very cautious that our questions were for our surveys, our, our survey questions were not leading um, because it's a very, very slippery slope when you start to, to ask those questions that you know, you're funneling people down a certain path. And that's something that we, we worked very, very hard to avoid and, and um, like I said, the, the MSSU was absolutely amazing in making sure that, that we were very careful in, in how we were wording our questions. So, so they were, they were our subject matter experts and, and did a fantastic job. Yeah, really. Absolutely. Um, the next question we have here is how long did the process take and how resource intensive was it, um, including staff and budget needs? Tony, I don't know if you want to, if you could speak to that from your experiences. Yeah, so um, to be honest, one of the reasons we didn't go, we, we did the modified James Lind Alliance and Dr. Lopakis, who had done a number of the Canadian JLA, post, the, the, the full JLA process assisted us, was the cost of engaging the J, uh, James Lind Alliance group to do that. And where Dr. Lopakis had done it, we felt comfortable doing that. So we did save some funds that way, but it, it, it was research intensive. Um, what I didn't highlight, uh, but what Robin and Laura Lee did was, you know, those video conferences. So in between the meetings, we divided into pairs, a clinician and a patient and, or caregiver uh, to review the questions. So they, we sort of took chunks of, of uh, those 388 uh, questions and you know reviewing that were they answered or not so there was a lot of um, a lot of time spent um, doing it nationally trying to balance uh, the different time zones uh, were some challenges but again I think the 
the engagement, the the participation from that steering committee, everyone was um, totally on board with it. Um, yeah, so I, I think yes, it was resource intensive. Uh, there was certainly, I think the the grant that we had um, was about thirty thousand, uh, and in part that was you know the transportation. So to get people from across Canada for that final meeting in Toronto, so there was certainly costs there, um, and then the dissemination, trying to make sure we made people aware of the survey. Um, I think was a was one thing, and maybe just so, just while I have the the microphone, just to seize on one of the uh, things that Robin raised about clinicians and trying to get clinicians involved. I, I think with the James Lind Alliance and people here, patient engagement, and and I think a lot of the clinicians thought, oh, this is for patients and caregivers, and they forgot the third part of that, the clinicians. Um, the one group we didn't want to hear from was researchers. Like it, it's really all about patients, caregivers, and clinicians. Who are involved in, in this in this condition, um, and again, I think it was the clinicians that it took a while to get them aware and uh, and participating, but eventually they 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 did. Thanks, Tony. Um, so we're just getting towards the end of our hour, and I'm sorry we won't be able to get to all the questions today. Um, but I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and thank our speakers um, for sharing all their knowledge with us um, on this really important topic. Um, so just let you know, I will send an email with an evaluation as well as a link to this presentation if you want to, to watch it again. Um, please fill the evaluation and let us know what you think of the event, how we can improve it, if you have ideas for other topics you'd like to see in these webinars. Um, and just to let you know, the next webinar will be on May 26th and it will be about learning health systems, which was what we had in January and had to reschedule. So we hope you can enjoy, join us then and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for your time today, and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Scott, for having yeah. us participate. Thanks. Likewise, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Bye bye.